welcome anyway and welcome everyone and thank you for that. And it's really great to see we've got a massive range of disciplines and a, a range of different um, stages that you're all at as well. So um, our panellists, unfortunately, Jill Hayhurst has come down with the flu and so I just got a rather um, sad sounding email from a, a phone call from her saying she couldn't participate but she'd really love to, um, particularly as she just finished her revisions last week having had her oral last month, so That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> um, So unfortunately she can't be with us, but we have Roger in Auckland who introduced himself before. Do you want to wave again, Roger, just so everyone can see who you are? Yep, there you are. Um, and then we've got Jenny here and Judy here, and we still represent a decent range, I think, of different kinds of experiences, and that was the idea of bringing this panel together from candidates who have been through the experience themselves, and then there's other people in the room who have been through those as well, which is great. I'm in the virtual room. Um, and then, of course, Jenny and Judy, who have extensive experience both as conveners of oral examinations, so chairing those oral examinations, as examiners, but also as supervisors as well. So we've got a series of different um, sort of questions that we've um, posed to our panellists. Um, and we'll go through those and then the second two we're going to kind of focus on the purpose of the oral and trying to set up how we might think really positively about it as, a, as an experience that is actually your chance to talk about your work in perhaps a way that you've never, you, you may never get the chance to again actually. <laughs> um, and it's, it's an opportunity. Um, so we want to think about, um, you know, how can we think about it positively? And if something does sort of throw up a spanner or an issue, then how can we deal with that? And then we want to talk about actually in the oral examination again as well. And after each of those two questions, our panellists will have a, a wee contribution from their own experiences. Um, we'll open up some questions from you guys. So if you've got any questions as the panellists are talking, just make a note and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can and then have time at the end as well. For questions too. So let's just start and perhaps we could start with um, Roger um, uh, in Auckland um, and if you could just start with talking a little bit about your experience of your oral defence. I know I gather it was a little bit complicated but actually the outcome was really good. Yeah that's that's correct. <laughs> Thanks Sophie. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and try to speak up a little bit. Um, so First of all, I would like to say that I had, a, I had a rather positive experience, maybe an unusual, but a rather positive experience in my oral exam. And um, I want to stress the, the, really the fact that it can be a very exciting and, and yeah, positive again, uh, a time in your life. So it's, uh, I want to make sure that no one is too stressed about this. Uh, it's an, as Bobby just said, it's, it is in most cases, well, you know, they are the nasty exceptions, but in most cases I would say um, it is a rare opportunity to talk about what you love, what you spend the last three or four years of your life on, and also um, actually you have people in the room who have a genuine interest in what you've done, at least partially, uh, a rudimentary uh, maybe knowledge about the field you're talking about, and um, they're not there, and that's that's why I don't like the term oral exam as uh, as such. I think that's flawed in itself. Um, they are there to clarify certain points. They want to have a discussion with you as an as a PhD candidate, and they want to clarify certain you know maybe maybe there were a few wording issues they quite they didn't understand or they want to know they want to tr they try to understand why you did what you did the way you did it. Um, so just uh, very brief because it was 20 past already and although, you know, I can tell, you can tell I like talking about myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a few words on the uh, oral exam itself. Um, it was a very formal uh, setting here in Auckland, uh, so everyone got the feeling this is a, this is a serious matter we, we're attending here, so it's not just uh, having a, a chit chat in a bar or in a cafe. So it is, it is a serious thing and it is worth preparing well for it. I don't know about the other universities here in Auckland, we get to see the examiner reports before the oral exam. So that's a an, an fantastic opportunity to prepare yourself, to familiarize yourself again with your work. What, what did the examiners not understand? What did they question? What were they unsure about? 
So you can work through your own um, um, thesis, you know, if you want to say so. Have a chat with your supervisor, bounce back some ideas, how to address those uh, questions and remarks from the examiners. Um, so in the oral exam itself, um, I felt, you know, quite in, not in control, but I, I felt good, you know, I, I thought, yes, I have it all prepared and I know my stuff, I'm, I'm the expert in the room. And then I experienced one person rather being a little pushy in his questions and he wouldn't stop, he would just go on and on and I would answer and he would, you know, he would just not let me go. And I was, I was, first I was a bit, um, you know, I don't know, anxious about it. And then I got annoyed at some point, really. So we got to that point where I, where I not <coughs> stood up, but literally stood up for myself and made a very strong comment about that, uh, you know, that's fair enough. All your criticisms and your, your, your interesting you know, contributions to the field are, are, are you know, um, are good to hear. And it's, it's, it's a fair comment. However, oops, I think our target's just gone. Can you still hear me? Yes. No, you're right. Oh, okay, good. Sorry. Um, so, however, um, without going into too much detail, the point of his sort of pushy way of doing the oral exam was uh, to develop or to, to create this inner urge in me then to stand up for my own ideas, you know, for my own work. And as I put it uh, in, uh, in that little um, sentence I sent to Sophie, so I developed as a full academic, I feel, during those two hours. I learned this is really my work. I own this. I know better than anyone else about this particular thing. And although I appreciate a criticism or an input or a question, but it's okay to say, well, you know, fair enough, but this is the way I think works best. And I think that's a crucial thing, and it's a crucial opportunity probably in the oral exam that you have the opportunity to really make your point and develop that self-confidence, really, to, you know, um, not necessarily oppose what the examiners say, but um, in a way, yes, yeah, stand your ground and um, develop this academic personality or, or whatever you want to call it. So overall, very positive with some weird, uh, unusual framing, I would put it. Um, <laughs> of course, the, the, the person then, when I actually stood up and made these comments, said, oh, Roger, I think we can finish here now the oral exam. And I said, ooh, shoot, you know, I might have ruined it. I might have, you know, well, well, what happened? And he said, well, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to stand up for your own ideas. I wanted you to sort of counter my arguments and really stand your ground. And I'm glad you, you did it so we can stop here. Well done. Thank you very much. And that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. <coughs> Roger, can I just ask who was in your oral? Did you have a convener plus two examiners or was it just um, one examiner? What's happening here was you have a, a convener or a chair which is as far removed from your discipline as possible. So I had someone from chemical science. <laughs> I did my, G, uh, my PhD in human geography. Um, I had a HOD, so a head of department representative, and that was the pushy person. Oh. Luckily, I mean, we still work together, so there are no, no bad feelings or anything. I had the New Zealand uh, examiner who was here in person in Auckland, and uh, my overseas examiner sent her uh, comments and questions, and they were asked then by the um, head of department representative. I also, and I would highly recommend that to everyone do so, I had my uh, supervisor with me, even though she was not allowed to do anything or say anything, but it was so, you know, it was just fantastic to having her sitting next to me, just, just be here. Yeah? Uh, that really calmed my nerves. So I can highly recommend doing that if possible. Mm. So your HOD representative took the questions from the external examiner for Correct. you? Correct. Okay. Yeah. okay, so that's, I think that might be something quite unique to Auckland. Yeah. Others might do something similar. Here, the internal examiner will take the external examiner's questions. Well, I, so, it was sort of a mix. So she asked some, and then he sort of chipped in and, and yeah. asked questions. Not necessarily maybe, uh, I mean, it's a few years ago now, as, as far mm -hmm. as I remember, maybe the, the, the uh, internal or the, the, the New Zealand examiner, she asked the, the, the questions first, and then he just wanted to clarify or, you know, sort yeah. of mm -hmm. contribute okay. to that. I'm not right. entirely sure. Sorry about that. Great, thank you. Okay, so maybe we'll turn now to Jenny. Do you want to um, sort of respond to that first set of questions in terms of thinking about, you know, the um, a, a, a really good PhD oral exam experience and one that might be a little bit more complicated? 
Oh, okay. Um, that was interesting hearing from Roger because it looks so each university is slightly different. Mm. Uh, and that if you took your HOD with you, normally they wouldn't say anything mm. uh, unless mm. um, given permission by an examiner. But anyway, um, I th think you know, the main thing is, you know, of course, when you get your examiner's reports back, it's very easy to panic and, you know, pick out all the negatives. And I suppose one that's worried me most this year, I've been involved with three this year, was a student who, of course, initially she read only the negative responses and thought she'd failed when, in fact, all three were, were positive. Um, but then, you know, took a breath, sat down, wrote her response, challenged, uh, not challenged, but went through all the comments. And when we got to the oral examination, she made a very nice presentation. She didn't want to see us supervisors the day before or anything like that. She did it all herself and made a presentation which seemed quite long. I think some people, the convener was a bit concerned that it was um, a bit long, but actually it was very useful because what could have been a, a difficult oral, because one examiner from overseas, he was very, um, he, he clearly not read the thesis very well. And that happens. I mean, your examiners are not always perfect. And you occasionally get one that perhaps is um, a bit more about themselves than about the student. <laughs> and so he challenged her uh, quite extensively, but she prepared so well and stood up for herself that that actually went well. She didn't get defensive. I mean, it's important if you can avoid it, not to get defensive. Mm -hmm. Although Roger's experience of standing up for yourself is really important, but not in a really negative way. So that had an excellent outcome uh, in the end. There wasn't a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Judy. Yeah. To well, the one that I dealt with um, <clears throat> was um, the overseas external um, queried the sample size, you know, mm -hmm. in social sciences sample size of the people that were the participants or interviewees and I was a bit worried about that I'd read bits of it um, and he was quite critical but amazingly in the oral the student who was very calm uh, explained why that sample suited the methodology she was using and after about 10 minutes it just all we could have ended then he was happy the others were happy so it was just really pleasantries and what are you going to do with the thesis how many things you're going to publish and so on so this is the beauty of the oral mm. I've had a lot to do with um, PhD exams before orals were compulsory in this university and they can get very tricky because you're circulating reports and the student in some ways doesn't get a chance to defend themselves. They feel relaxed that they don't have to do the oral. But in fact, the oral is a gift. I think it's a gift because as we've said, uh, Roger and Jenny, it's a chance for you to stand up for yourself and say, well, I did this and this is why. And if the examiner has a genuine worry, which I would think would be a worry with a small sample, uh, then you can justify it. So there are usually reasons you do things, not because you're lazy or stupid or something. There is a reason and you can defend that. So that's, that's, that was very good and it was really all over very quickly. <laughs> we could have walked out then really. Um, that's all I've got to say about a good one. I could tell you about a few bad ones. <laughs> 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 Um, I wanted to pick up on what we think the purpose of the oral is. And, and if we can just go to our panel panelists, we've kind of said that it's an opportunity to stand up for yourself to some sort of work. Is it always that? Is it something about, is there, is there more to it? So sort of thinking about the range of different roles of the oral at different contexts mm. and there might be specific issues that how that um, how kind of plays out, I guess. Okay, so order the summit, let's start with Judy, about the, the, what is the purpose of the oral? Perhaps in different um, situations, there might be slightly different things. In some cases, uh, as I, it's very useful for a candidate to be told that, you know, your work is good, these two chapters would make a good article, or I come from the discipline of history, this would make a good book, if you move this chapter to there, I've had someone 
or be that. Um, so that they can give you guidance. And remember too that these people could, may well be in the future people you want as referees. So this is one reason always to be very polite. <laughs> and also to appreciate the work that, I mean, there are a few sloppy ones. We don't use them once we discover <laughs> they're sloppy. <laughs> but uh, they can uh, they can be very influential in your career if you're going into academia. So respect them and be always very grateful for the work they've put in. It's not always much fun reading a thesis, <laughs> especially if it's a bit off your area. Uh, you've got to engage very well. Um, so that's really the purpose, I think, of part of the purpose. And as uh, Roger said, and I say to my students, only three people are going to read this thesis. So, you know, it's not going to be earth shattering at this stage. So you concentrate on making a thesis. But they do engage with it, and parts of it they will know very, very well. And they will zero in, of course, on their hobby horse. So it always is useful to know what their hobby horse is. We lost them. That horse. Can you still hear us? Yeah. Oh, it's a bit just, oh, oh yeah, come yeah, back, come back. The screen just went completely blank. It was most disconcerting. Okay. <laughs> it takes a while, at least in our university, to get to know who the examiners are because we keep that confidential for very good reasons. Uh, but if you know that so and so is very keen on an aspect of your thesis, it's good to be aware of that. Uh, you know, you've got a bit of psychology here helps <laughs> understand your examiner as they're trying to understand you. Jenny. Yes, um, we don't, I mean, not we, but, but at Otago, what was I going to say about Otago? But anyway, um, we, might, we try as far as possible to have all examiners mm -hmm. at the oral, and that can be by distance. We, we might often have two of them sitting on the screen as we're doing today from wherever they are in the world so that no one else speaks for that examiner. Um, so... You know, they're there, and we adjust the time to fit wherever it is. I've done orals at midnight with France. <laughs> <laughs> and have and also we just adjust into the afternoon if we have an Australian oral uh, examiner or whatever. So that, that's the first thing. We really make sure that we've got all three examiners. The other thing is, of course, that the supervisors, you know, I, I'm a geographer by training, and I, I work now in Pacific Studies, so I... Um, supervise and examine across a number of social science disciplines and sometimes uh, supervisors perhaps I mean they ought to get the methodology that their student uses but there are times when when supervisors might recommend somebody as an examiner who may not be perfect I mean they're not perfect it's sometimes quite hard to get the right examiner and we've had a particular issue over the years, and this will have affected some of you, with using different kinds of methodologies, especially indigenous methodology, and all the various types of methodologies that are used in the Pacific and in the Maori world and others. South American students have had the same thing with. And occasionally we'll get an examiner who really does not um, understand mm -hmm. at all. And we've chosen them thinking, you know, by the look, looking, we look at what they've published and how they've built their career, but sometimes it doesn't work out well. And um, I think once you see the examiner's report and if you see somebody that really doesn't seem to get it, then make sure in your justification that you explain, as Judy said, mm -hmm. why you've chosen that methodology. Because you will be able to make the good case. You're the expert on this. But it really, it does come up, and in, and in fact, I've been involved in three this year, which is actually a bit distressing, where an examiner has not understood the nature of the methodology used. And every time the student has been able to defend it, but, and, and there's always been a good outcome, but it, it's quite scary to the student. It's actually upsetting because they've built their entire thesis on this. So I'm just... It may not happen to you, the one's about to submit, but just saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's a good portion mm -hmm. to be able to um, 
recognize where your examiners are coming from, I think, mm. is really, really important. And at what point, can I just ask you, we've got your oral next week, at what point did you find out who your examiners were? Uh, I haven't. Uh, oh. So graduate research school, is a, so they won't let you know, so I'll find out when you walk in the Yeah. And have you seen the individual reports? I have, oh, but okay. just, they just say internal okay. examiner, New Zealand right. examiner. Okay. So I was kind of curious, what is the rationale? Because nobody seems to be able to tell me, except to say, to stop you from contact, contacting the examiners. Mm. But of course, you could easily sign a waiver to say you wouldn't contact them. Mm. But I think the point of knowing where they come from is quite useful mm. in preparing your questions. Yeah. So, at least you can work it out. It, it, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very tricky. Uh, I'll refer to a case that I had when there was no oral, and thank God there was no oral. Mm. I had the convenience for a student from Africa, I won't say much more than that. And he had a brilliant supervisor who had left the university but was still keeping on helping him. When he got the reports, he obviously lost it and he wrote a very awful email to his supervisor, you tell the examiner that I'm not doing this, blah, 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 blah. And we, uh, I managed him. But... Um, <laughs> If that had been, uh, if the name had gone out earlier, well, he didn't have the name, uh, he could have written to that examiner in New Zealand and been very abusive and just the whole, we would just have to reschedule another exam. It was deplorable. And on that same note, if I could say, um, if, you, if a supervisor or if you think that you don't understand the culture of the PhD exam or defence process, make sure you find out. Mm -hmm. Because this person had obviously come from an area where women were not respected. Unfortunately, most of his examiners were women. I was a woman, and still am, and uh, <laughs> so was the supervisor. And he was very, he could hardly cope with that. Um, so that needs to be kept in mind and that's one reason. I do know of an MA student that somehow got the name of the examiner who went up to them personally and, and told them off. This was before. So there are reasons. <laughs> and do you think it was before because they didn't have an oral? And I'm wondering whether with the knowledge that you have a chance to, to answer those questions in person might have avoided the email it, it may well have, but I think he would have lost it in the oral because of the way he behaved to me and other people. Yeah. Um, can we just go to Roger, just to, um, if you've got anything to add about the sort of overall purpose of the oral. Yeah, yeah. Right over um, to right um, well, I completely agree with both Jenny and Judy. Um, so absolutely on the same page here. Maybe two things I'd like to add. Um, so the oral exam actually is an opportunity um, to just, you know, almost casually discuss your work because just see before the oral exam or before the examiner get your work, it's only you and your examiner, who re uh, you and your supervisor, sorry, who, who uh, only know about the work, uh, who have been working on the thesis, who have been thinking these ideas through over and over again. So you really know about it. And, but the examiner, as, as you said, you, um, might not be really in the, in the perfect space to understand what you've done. So this is really then an opportunity for you to just discuss and, you know, like the methodology example, just clarify. And then mostly the examiners, they're not there to, to make your life hard. They don't want to find something desperately in your thesis which is wrong or doesn't make sense or is it's not robust enough. They, are, they truly, generally want to understand and want to make sure that your work meets you know certain standards obviously mm -hmm. the other thing and i think it's it's to, it links to what judy said your oral uh, your examiners will be most likely the first two people you will ask for a reference when you're looking for a job so not only be nice to them but make sure they really understand the true value of your work and appreciate what you've done because only then they can write you a good reference uh so for you to land your first job hopefully so that's the only thing like to add, thank you. 
Okay, so how about we just throw it open to the floor for some questions before we actually go on to some more sort of concrete tips about the actual examination process and what you might do in there. And I want to pick up and come back to um, that kind of balance that um, Jenny and Roger both spoke to about not being defensive but also being assertive about what you've done and how you've, um, you know, substantiating your claims in a really kind of positive way because I think that's really, really important and it's, it's quite a fine line, particularly if you're feeling like you're being challenged by the examiner constantly. So we'll come back to that, but um, questions. Who, who would like to um, pick up with any specific questions about what we've, what we've discussed so far? And nice. I'd like to know um, how long the exams were. Practically. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I think we could say they range in length quite considerably. I've been in one that was half an hour. Sounds oh, like an hour to two hours. Two hours. Yes. Yeah. I think generally conveners don't want them to necessarily go for more than two hours. No, two hours probably these days is the limit, but. Mm -hmm. If, you know, it, it could happen, uh, mm -hmm. my own oral was three hours and the person who gave me the most trouble said afterwards when we were having a drink, <laughs> well, mine took eight hours and I was going to make you suffer. <laughs> oh. uh, she hasn't changed in temperament. <laughs> I hope I have. <laughs> Our French one took four hours, two hours with a translator and then the translator signed off. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, no, it, it depends. So I think, I think it also depends on institutions as well. So check with your research school or whoever organises your orals um, on what their guidelines are um, and, and, and definitely be quite clear about the kinds of questions you want to ask to get clarity on that sort of thing. Actually, just within that, what's an acceptable amount of time to use for your presentation? Because I talk about a brief presentation, but I mean, that could be like a three minute thesis version or it could be you know, 10 or 15. So I'm just curious what's a polite amount of time to use for your presentation? Yeah, I don't know, 15 minutes? 15, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. The one I had recently was longer and I was a bit concerned about that, but in mm. fact, it was necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And um, I might add as well that anyone who is um, not a PhD candidate out there who's got experiences from their institutions, then it will be really useful to hear those as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to chip in, feel free. <laughs> Have we got any other questions there? I'm a bit confused about, you know, how we're not meant to know who the examiners are, which I think is quite blurry in practice. Mm. Um, although no one will say anything very specific about that, understandably. But if you're meant to, you know, what's the thing if you have an external examiner who you haven't quoted in your thesis, you know, whose work you haven't used? I mean, so is it up to your supervisor to to be directing you in some way? Good question. But then, but then. Yeah, <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> Usually the examiners are appointed, what, a, a minimum of three months before submission. So it's possible that you've pretty much finished by the time the examiners are appointed. But I guess a, a supervisor has in mind mm. who they would ask, and at least in my experience, uh, we often ask, well, I have often asked mm. the student, is there anyone you don't want? Mm. And certainly in the Pacific uh, which is a small world and islands, uh, in a small island, sometimes they don't want a particular academic who their family had an argument with 20 years ago or something. Yeah. Uh, and you've got, you've got to take those yeah. things into consideration. So I always ask the student, is there anyone you don't want because of personal reasons or concerns? And they... Probably some don't care, uh, mm. but others say, don't give me Dr. So-and-so. And I usually don't ask why, I just accept that. And I know, sorry, there's another question there, Lachlan. Is it? No. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say... Before we go to the next question, um, I, I, would caut I would be cautious of being 
almost obsessed with knowing who the examiners is and whether that would make any positive or negative impact if you do or you don't. Um, because, I mean, for your, for your, in most cases, I would say for your local examiner, for the New Zealand one, uh, that person has not necessarily have any clue about your work. Don't underestimate the practicality aspect of finding an examiners. It's really, you, you know, your supervisor's in a tight spot to find the right examiners. They don't really get uh, any appreciation for that. They won't get paid for it, and they're over, you know, notoriously overworked already. So it is it's mostly actually, at least for one of your two examiners, that your supervisor asks and calls in a favor. And, um, and I personally, but that's my really personal opinion, I don't think it, it is helpful in any kind of way whether you know or you don't know your examiner, whether you've quoted that person or not, because this is a robust academic process. And even if you haven't quoted that person, um, th that doesn't have any negative impact on the examiner's comments or view of your work. And if, that, if your examiner is the person in the world, in your area, you most likely have quoted him or her anyway. <laughs> so don't, I mean, I, I see students getting stressed about this. I personally think it's good not to know because otherwise you might get stressed. Oh, oh, oh I only cited that person once. You know, well, well, what does she think about me? No, just, you know, focus on yourself. It's about you. It's you shining there after all this hard work and it's not about the examiners. I think the shift and focus, there needs to be a shift in focus, yeah. Um, and I think I'd add actually to that, um, that blurriness about whether you know who they are or not. Um, I think as, as candidates, you can open up a conversation with your supervisor about, um, you know, the, the examiners and say, you know, I think these people might be quite good. And that's actually really helpful to the supervisor as well. Um, so, you know, take an active role um, it depends obviously on your supervisory relationship and your institution and mm -hmm. the culture within your discipline as well. Um, and all of those things are variable too, um, which is probably why it's so blurry. But I, I think, um, you know, yes, it, it ideally shouldn't matter whether you know who they are or not. Sometimes it's a little bit helpful, particularly with questions of interdisciplinarity or methodology, um, to know where they're coming from because you can then frame your arguments in the oral um, towards those, understanding, you know, where they're coming from and then you can kind of make a case for yourself in light of that. Mm -hmm. But you can often get clues, even within the examiner's reports, as to where they are coming from and the language that they use and the things that they pick up on. So when you get your reports, read them really critically and think about, um, you know, well, where's this person coming from and reading what I've written? Um, not, not about what they're saying about what you're doing, but where are they coming from? So read that really critically and you might get some clues there as well. Did anyone else have anything to add to that before we... Yeah, I have a question. So yep. I was wondering if you can reflect on like what kind of question we can expect. I understand that it might be very different depending on the discipline and the kind of project that we all are doing. Uh, but I was wondering if there are any particular aspect that we can uh, expect some questions on, like methodology or theory or anything as such. Uh, that's very hard to answer. I mean, you may get an examiner who is very keen on methodology in your discipline, whatever discipline it may be, and they may that should come out in their report and you can expect that. But sometimes there are just questions out of left field <coughs> and uh, you have to be prepared for it mentally, even if you haven't quite got the answer. My advice is to always take time to think before you answer. You have got the time and just uh, say something like, well, that's a very interesting question and your brain's <coughs> ticking over trying to analyse it. And don't be afraid to ask for clarification because sometimes the questions are a bit, you know, you get a long sentence, blah, 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 and you don't know what they're on about. Uh, so you, you've got a right to do that. You're trying to communicate your ideas clearly and you need clarification from the other side to do that. And there's a role there as well for the convener, if the convener, you might be able to say this because you're conveners, but, <laughs> but I, I, I would hope that actually if it's really clear that the answer that the candidate's giving and the question that 
youth paper that the examiners asked actually are mismatched, then the convener can step in and ask for clarity with those kinds of questions as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think sometimes also, you know, in terms of specific questions, sometimes examiners are, are, are just seeking clarity and in something that you've been dealing with for, for three to four years, so you, you know it extremely well, but it might not be that apparent and immediately clear to the examiner. So sometimes they're, they're, all they're doing really is just seeking a bit of clarity. Um, and I, mean, I must say, even though my, my own experience of doing the oral was about nine or ten years ago, I, I, I remember that feeling of dread like it was yesterday about, oh my God, somebody's going to catch me out. They're, go they're going to know what I haven't done. And I think, you know, as the authors of a thing, we might know where the gaps are. But a good examiner is really going to look for what you have written rather than what you haven't written. And, and I think that's, that's the other important thing to keep in mind. And if you've got an examiner who keeps harping on about something that they see as an absence, um, you know, I think it's, it's useful to see that as an opportunity for a further publication, yes. something that can come after the PhD, but rather instead of sort of getting defensive about what you have actually done, just to, to address it as, you know, thanks, that's a really neat idea for this publication further on, and I'll take your advice on it. But I think, um, yeah, in terms of, it is a bit difficult to answer on, on, on specific questions because, you know, the genders of the examiners might be different. But... Um, just to reiterate some of the points here, I think it is important not to get defensive mm -hmm. um, and, and it's easy to slip into that mode because you're so intimately familiar with what your work is and somebody else who's reading it for the first time is, is not. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's not that they're trying to catch you up. They're seeking to, 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 to find if, if you have exercised sound judgment in the claims that you've made. Mm -hmm. Could I just quickly follow up on that? So I would say, I would be inclined to say there are two sort of groups of questions you can expect. One would be those who you already know about through the examiner's report. So those you prepared for, those who might, you know, question some of your methodology or whatever you've done in your work. So that's, that's I would say, the, the, the big chunk of questions you will have to deal with. The other group of questions, I would say, uh, would be, Questions, uh, I, I can frame it, questions out of interest. So the examiner might be having an interest, truly like, yeah, you know, how come you did talk to those women in Bangladesh and, and why, you know, what's the story behind it? They're truly interested in that. And it's easy for you to understand. And also it's, you know, it eases the tension a little bit so you can relax. This is something you can easily, you know, it's like a, almost like a small talk. And I personally have never heard, and I'm, well, I'm sure there are exceptions, that, but I have never heard about anything that an examiner holds back a question or has a nasty question up his or her sleeves just to get you in the oral exam. So all the, 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 the big issues will be addressed in the report. So there is no reason to feel anxious about a question you might not, you know, be able to answer. And even if you can't answer it, as, as you know, we just heard before, say, you know, well, that's, you know, I've never came across that idea. It's fantastic. This is something I really want to pursue, you know, after my PhD. It's thanks for the, you know, thanks for the input. It's not necessarily, as, as we heard before, don't get defensive. It's not that there is a, a, a substantial gap or anything. Um, so because, you know, before you submit your work, your supervisor made sure it's robust. And it might not be perfect, and that's, that's not necessary anyway. Uh, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. But it is robust, and there won't be any major gaps you need to feel anxious about. Thank you. Have you got any other questions there? I'm looking at the bathroom in this room. Any other question? How do you stay calm? How do you stay calm? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whilst you're, whilst you're you know, familiar with the work, um, and of course, my oral is is via Zoom, so even the convener is by distance. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm just thinking of, I, I kind of do better if I can shake somebody's hand and you kind of, you know, have that icebreaker or something. So, mm. any tips with, yeah, keeping the nerves it, under control? Will your supervisors be with you? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, well, Karen's one, so. Oh, <laughs> right next to me. <laughs> it's very unusual to have a convener. Yeah. 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 
the convener's role, well, I can't speak for all conveners, but I always try to talk to the mm. examiners beforehand. And now and again, I'll know people and I'll say, well, you know, how are the elections in Germany or something? Or New Zealand? Um, <laughs> a bit of small talk and getting to know them so they, they sort of warm up. And also when the candidate comes in, I try and do a bit of small talk then rather to calm them down and say, look, so-and-so has just come back from Fiji or somewhere and still has a tan, how we all envy her or something like that. Um, so that they relate to you as a person yeah. rather than as a thesis. And uh, they can see that you possibly are. They will know you're a bit nervous. If you're not a bit nervous, you're something wrong with you. Um, you need that little bit of adrenaline to think quickly. Um, and just pause, and take deep breaths. Uh, and pregnant silences are sometimes quite good because examiners fill that up because they like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, remember, don't hurry it. Okay. Yeah. Well, kind of, you got something to add to that? Um, just, uh, I just thought we haven't covered the sort of situation where um, somebody, a candidate, might fail the oral um, and. I was wondering if, from your experience, um, what sort of circumstances might lead you to feel that the candidate should not um, should not be awarded with the PhD? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a fail. Yeah. One. I have had an awkward situation, but it was not here in New Zealand. It was a Danish one, and if you know the Scandinavian PhDs, it's very different and um, the student has to present in front of an audience of family and friends. Mm -hmm. And and, um, and there's also another room where all the gifts have been piled. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a good idea. And was, you know, having you know, whizzed off to Copenhagen and, and had to launch the oral as the external examiner in this case, um, and ask, deliberately ask the candidate a really easy question that there would have been no doubt that he could have answered and he couldn't answer it. Yeah. Um, and that was a bit difficult. So I put that down to nervousness and we just carried on and it all came together by the end. But I've never, I haven't had a fail. He didn't fail. I mean, end, I, I think also by the time you get to the yeah. oral, should um, it should be pretty much clear that you know that that's it's a solid piece of work, and there's there's obviously a lot of trust invested in the supervisor that they feel you mm -hmm. are now ready to submit. I mean, years back in um, in, in the South African context, um, I wasn't directly involved in it, but um, I knew of somebody who didn't make it through the oral, and it was a case of being caught out that that person's work was not their own. Oh. And yeah. and I mean, this is it's a very bad reflection on the supervisor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to some degree, the supervisor's reputation is also at stake when the candidate is going to, to do the oral. Um, I have, as an examiner, uh, asked people to resubmit twice. In um, one case, to me, it was obviously poor supervision. And the other case, it was poor supervision and the institution should never have let the thesis go forward. Mm -hmm. One chapter was terrific. The rest, the footnoting, everything was awful. Mm. A good editor was needed. Mm. And I said, this shouldn't even come to me. Uh, so that was, it wasn't a fail, but it was a resubmit. Mm. But it, if there was plagiarism, we would yes. fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'll just add to that, um, I have a colleague who was involved in a resubmit as well. And it was, um, um, it was I think it was quite tricky for them, but again, it was, I think, um, to do with, uh, it was just submitted too early. It was like submitted six months too early. So it's something to be really um, aware of and to get, you know, if you, it, to be sure that you have faith in your, um, your supervisor to make sure that they will check on the detail and um, be really clear with you about the polish that's required and that sort of thing. Um, and, and the sort of sense of the, the other thing that I, I heard from this colleague that um, was missing in this particular thesis was there was lots of fantastic evidence, there was lots of, um, you know, the literature was all there, but there was no coherence mm -hmm. thesis 
through it as well as being the lack of polish and the, um, the um, all of those other details that we're missing as well. So I think um, you know, be really sure about um, you know, the, the standard. Have a look at other theses if you're not sure. Um, go to the library and have a look at other theses. Ask your supervisor for theses that were really good. At Otago, we've got a list, I think, of excellent theses, yeah, exceptionally yeah, good right. theses. Um, other institutions might have the same thing, but check what that standard is. Um, if you're not quite, com you know, some I know that I know um, some supervisors might be absolutely at the top of their game. But they're so, so, so busy that that minutiae of detail is fantastic on the ideas, but they might not be so good on the detail. Make sure you get a complimentary view that is good on the detail. Or go and ask other people, you know, um, you need to get that feedback on the structural components of the work as well as the substantive ideas. Um, so, yeah, that would be my advice. It, it, that this, making sure that your thesis is of the standard that gets through, that's as much... Um, supervisor role, I think, personally, I don't know how this may have other views, um, as, as a um, candidate. So make sure that, you know, you've got that relationship going and you're feeling secure. And it doesn't always work that way. It though. doesn't. I, I had a, a student, I wasn't convening, but who had, had was in a different department and had had multiple changes of supervisors mm. over an eight-year period mm. and eventually came to me and, you know, said, I want to get this thesis through. And we very hard on it for a couple of years and at the end it still really in my mind wasn't ready for presentation and mm. she wanted it out of the way she wanted to move on and do other things with her life and I said well there are a number of options it will fail outright or it might require a major uh, revision or there could be minor revisions or it might just sail through well and and I wrote a set the letter a supervisor can write a letter that can be released afterwards, not to the student, to say, you know, I am not satisfied that this thesis is ready for submission. Supervisors do do that on occasion. Mm -hmm. And I did that. It went off to the examiners, chose the examiners very carefully. They were, you know, in the right field and passed. A few minor revisions, but it went through. And I mean, no one was more thrilled than she was, but also <laughs> I was, you know, very yeah. relieved. But that was pre-oral. Now, if she'd had to have an oral, uh, I think she would have been fine because she mm. could explain it well. But it was, it, it was a language issue and also all the different disciplines that she'd been involved with. It really was a bit messy, but there was a coherent theme there and it passed. So mm. <laughs> I'm not yeah. trying to put you off. <laughs> These things do happen. Mm. So I think the upshot of that in relation to the, the fear of failing is actually... It's really, really rare. Very rare. Um, and, you know, there are things that you can do to make sure that you're in the right position before you submit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, I think one of the things that's very important is um, actually preparing and even rehearsing for the oral, like mm -hmm. getting someone to ask you the questions and actually articulate it aloud. Um, because I was uh, one of the internal examiners at an oral here where um, the student was just so nervous that actually they didn't come across well. It was actually a really unfortunate um, situation where they, they just didn't give co coherent answers to a whole set of questions, even though the thesis actually, you know, when there was issues, but um, I think it actually was one of those situations where the oral let the student mm -hmm. down. Mm. And, you know, like English wasn't his first language, um, there's a whole set of circumstances. But actually, you know, that's where one can go, um, can go wrong. And, you know, on one level, you get the chance to craft your written piece, but uh, when you speak aloud to it, um, it's not something that you can kind of go back over <laughs> necessarily. Mm. And um, so uh, I just think as, as rehearsals are really, um, really good. Yeah. So, and sometimes you can get um, even your kind of peer group. Mm. Um, mm. I had uh, my oral, the, my peer group gave me a much tougher <laughs> oral <laughs> than my actual oral was a doddle by comparison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think it's really valuable to do that. Yeah. It's good practice for them too. That's right, yeah. indeed. Yeah. So I think there is, going back to your question before about how do you stay calm, and how do you give yourself? And I guess we've said it until they're talking about SIPs that actually in the oral. Yeah. <laughs> Quite honestly, thank you, Karen. <laughs> um, 
is to know yourself in those kinds of situations. What do you like about talking verbally um, a- about your ideas? Um, have you had lots of practice at it? Um, you know, is there something you need to do some work on? You know, you know the work, but can you can you comfortably talk about it? You can write it, obviously. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, and know what makes you nervous and what makes you defensive. Again, going back to that don't get defensive point. Um, um, and sometimes if you do get irritated, I notice Roger said right at the beginning he started to get a bit irritated, which was actually the, the, the motivation for actually being really assertive about um, what he'd done, which is great. But what is your response if you start to get irritated? And think about it. You know, you might have a, a, an examiner who goes on and on and keeps questioning you. How are you going to respond to that? And how are you going to keep yourself in check if you get irritated or defensive? So those kinds of things, think about yourself and how you deal with those kinds of um, situations. Has anyone else got any sort of tips for in the oral itself? Um, how to manage the stress, how to manage tricky questions? We've already talked about a few in terms of making sure you have time. Well, the convener often can help, and it, it does depend on the personality and so on. And often, if they know the discipline, mm-hmm. um, they can redirect it. Uh, some examiners just go on. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you can say well Dr X or Tom or whatever his name is well we that's really helpful to Mary or whoever it is how about uh, your friend from Auckland what do they think um, can they does that tie in and just get them or shut them up for a while? Mm-hmm. but some conveners are not as interventionist it just, it's, it's, everyone is different. Every exam is different. Um, I've seen situations where the two examiners arguing <laughs> away, and that's good because it's like a tennis match. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, you've got to diffuse that. They don't, they don't, don't get angry. I've never seen anyone get really angry, but uh, they talk away. This was in philosophy. <laughs> and, and that went on, that did go on a while and the supervisor, I asked him to comment on something and closing him down was quite difficult. But it was very productive. That was a long old, in the end, all the student had to do was change the title and the press. <laughs> so that's philosophy. <laughs> no philosophy here, I don't think. What about others? Or anyone else who's been involved in an oral? No, I, just to follow from Junie, so the convener, you, hopefully your supervisors will choose the convener very wisely. Go through the list for the unit. They will go through the list for the university, but you would hope that they will pick somebody that's known to be a helpful convener. And I have to say, the last one I did last I was at last week as a, as a supervisor, the convener um, turned out to be an absolute gem. Uh, she was from the law faculty. Oh, right, yeah, and is. one of the examiners um, picked up on ethics and couldn't understand why ethics, but anyway, <laughs> why ethics was such a significant part of the thesis. Well, I mean, everyone from Otago knows that you know, it's absolutely integral. I'm sure it is everywhere else and criticised the fact that, that there was a discussion about ethics and the field work and all of that. And the convener let this go on for a little while and just and said, well, I happen to be on the University Ethics Committee, and I can say, and that diffused it straight away. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the role of the convener is <laughs> very, very important. But, you know, for the oral, yes, practice, what Karen said. Practice, you know, get people, family or friends or somebody to fire questions at you a few days before and have a go. Because, it, yeah, she's right. It never turns out to be as bad in the oral as <laughs> the practice one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it is also to, in that mode of practicing to verbalize an idea. It's a very different mode mm-hmm. of communicating it from writing. So it just sort of repeats what Karen says. Like when you're writing, you have a chance to go back and and read it again and rework sentences. But verbally, sometimes, you know, things just, they don't come out no, exactly how you meant them. And true. I think, again, I mean, it, you know, it would take a pretty poor examiner to fail you for being nervous or to really, you know, have a go at you for being nervous. And, and I think most examiners understand, just somebody said, they, they know that you're coming and they're quite nervous. 
Um, and I, I, I mean, I sort of have a tendency to rub it on really quickly when I'm nervous. And somebody said to me, just take a, a bottle of water and when you, when you think you're just going to go ahead and speed on the conversation, just sit back and have a drink of water. And it just it gives the appearance that you're really cool, calm, and you're just sort of go. But it gives you, you know, just that moment just to sit back, think about what has been said. And I had just my internal, so it was just two examiners that I had, an internal and an external, and um, nobody else in the room. And I, I asked the examiners if I could write down their questions as, as they were going. Because as, as Judy's saying, sometimes they go off on a tangent and they lose the question in their conversation. So I think it helps just to, to write down what they're saying so that you can then look at it and discern the question. Um, and yeah, just don't be afraid to ask them to repeat it or to say it in a different way that, that can be sometimes clearer. Uh, just one other point. Uh, I don't think anyone listening or contributing is marking or Pacific Islanders. Yeah. There's a couple of people from the Pacific Islanders. Oh, right. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, but often people from the Pacific uh, like uh, to have support people there, and, and anyone can in our university have a support whānau who comes along. And that's very comforting for some people. These people, the convener, say you're not allowed to speak, but you can be there. Uh, I think that helps uh, the examiners to see that you belong to someone. And it's very comforting if you're Māori or Pacific Island person to have that kind of support, because it is a rather alien environment for everyone. Uh, so, you know, I don't know about other universities, but it doesn't hurt to have a few people there that you trust or afterwards can say, oh, you did well, or, you know, something nice. Uh, but it's up to you. Others prefer nobody. <laughs> Roger, have you got tips for the actual examination? Um, well, I can only second what Karen said. Um, practice. Ideally, I personally found practice among your peers. Do it in your PhD group um, rather than having staff involved. That's um, then let go of the idea it's an exam. You, you mm. fail this daunting idea. Try to let go of that. And at the same time, allow to be nervous. I think that's a normal, mm. that makes you human. You're not a machine in that process. You're human. And your examiners are human. They're nice people mostly. You know, they like the same people like you. You know, they are, they are humans. They're not nasty, you know, uh, uh, people who, who uh, have some, some uh, agenda, a hidden agenda or anything. Um, and lastly, uh, just one thing popping up in my mind regarding the Skype or this, the, the, the mm. Zoom interview that could actually, even though I'm, I feel, you know, I feel you that I, I like to shake hands and have a little chit chat and sit, you know, on, on the same t around the same table with, with in these situations. But actually, being removed from that, sitting in a in a familiar space at your university, probably, or maybe in your uh, supervisor's office. I don't know where you're gonna, where you guys gonna sit, can actually work in the advantage. It can really make you feel at ease with the situation rather than being my, my examiners and my oral exam room was freezing. It was like, it felt like minus 10 degrees. The aircon was on full on and I was, it was in the middle of summer and I was, you know, it was horrible. So maybe being not in this formal um, setting could actually work for you in this case. And it has, I mean, I think when it almost has the same feeling like you Skype with your mom. You know, <laughs> 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 you see those examiners, as, you know, as a friend or relative, you, you want to come up there. You talk about your I think if possible, it sounds silly, but if possible, take these, these pressure out of this whole process. I see, you know, PhD students in my school who, oh, who, who are breaking under this pressure. And I really try not just to comfort them because I, I'm a nice person or anything, <laughs> <laughs> which I am, obviously. But the point. Totally humble. Yeah, I'm the best. <laughs> um, can I, I just want to sort of important, I think, to to get a better understanding of what this process really is about. Um, 
and uh, you know have a chat uh, with with people who just been through the process. Maybe another thing I could add. Um, and again, about failing. Oh, come on, you know, it's it's most unlikely that you can fail at this stage. Your supervisor, they do a reasonably good job. The worst thing, I always tell students, the worst thing what can happen is that you have to resubmit. And, you know, being humble or being outright there, I had to resubmit my thesis. I'm out there, you know, it was not pleasant. It was devastating. I had to reassemble my sort of self-confidence over a week's period. But afterwards, in retrospective, it was the best thing what happened to me. I produced such a much better thesis after that. I had such a better understanding, and it helped me to to get a postdoc straight away. And it was such, you know, such a helpful, even though at that moment quite terrifying and you know disappointing experience. But in the end, even the worst outcome of, I would say, resubmission can actually work for you in the end. So it's not not about failing, really. I think you know people are so scared of failing. And I, I don't. I think we we need to let go of that. Um, mm -hmm. It's really rare. And even though we like to tell these stories, you know, oh, I have this guy who did this and this, and then he failed. You know, I think these are really the exceptions, <laughs> the rare exceptions where people actually fail. And just repeat it. You know, tell that yourself. Uh, that yeah. helps the time. I think you found on your nerves. Yes. Right. Sorry, I talked much. No, no, Marcel, you had um, to yeah, it was just sort of to, to iterate this thing about the exam, and I think um, Judy said it quite nicely right at the beginning that, you know, to see it as a gift is, it sort of just reframes the whole experience, and I think, Roger, you sort of said it as a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I remember also, you know, once those sort of feelings of dread had passed with, when, I, when I was doing my oral, I remember the getting into a conversation, um, so an examiner asked a question, and we started talking about um, a particular aspect of, of my thesis and I remember thinking um, these people are taking me seriously like they actually think I'm one of them and, and it was this, like just absolute flip where I thought oh like okay I'm not under trial here I'm on trial and it's not about somebody trying to humiliate me but it's like that they're trying to actually make me better at what I'm thinking and and so it was a kind of like a, a, a respect that they they were taking me seriously as a budding academic and I think that that sort of when that switch sort of flipped in the exam mm -hmm. I think I became a lot calmer mm -hmm. um, and then it wasn't going to be why didn't you do this and you should have done that it was just you know really that mm -hmm. they were taking me seriously as an academic and and that's really what that process is mm -hmm. about. Once when I was examining it was a slightly different situation to what we have here. This Thank is at another much. university. Go, I went, walked in and I said, helpful. Thank you. nice to meet you, Dr. Smith, even though she had <laughs> been long, because I knew she would fly through. It was just a, such a beautiful thesis. Mm -hmm. And I think that relaxed her a lot. Mm -hmm. I hope the, the yeah. supervisor didn't mind my presumption. <laughs> That's a nice thing yeah. But, you know, you are part of a club and yeah. these people respect you. Mm. Uh, that's really important, and uh, you you really are lucky. So um, I just wanted to speak to Roger's comment about making the space if you are on Zoom, or um, I did my oral um, by telephone. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Glasgow, it was 9 o'clock at night, it was, um, I think it must be 10 o'clock in the morning here, and um, so I was sitting in my living room in our little rental house in Glasgow um, with the dog lying on the floor. Um, and the heater going because <laughs> it was the middle of winter. <laughs> oh no, it wasn't, but it might as well have been. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um, and it was exactly that. I could have all these bits of paper in front of me, and no one knew. And so I had a bit of paper here about methodology and the key points from the, you know, and I kind of managed to space it all out. So and it actually worked in my favour, even though it was really odd not being there. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that lack of even being able to see them see is really them. strange. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, my convener and um, the two examiners who were there, they were both in the office and in, in, in the Richardson building, which is <laughs> where I work now. Um, and they were, um, you know, they were both there. So I could kind of imagine where they were, <laughs> you know, it was quite strange, but it was fine. Yeah. Um, are there, I want to just kind of, I guess I want to wrap up with some key points that we've kind of um, pulled out uh, and I've been making a few notes and perhaps um, anyone else who's kind of been making some notes could chip in about key things that they've um, 
that they're going to take away um, from today's session that hopefully will make them feel a bit, little, make, make all of you folk who are about to enter this next phase um, feel a little bit better um, and a little bit more confident. Um, I think it's really, really important to reframe this, not as an oral defence, not as something scary at the end, not as an examination, but as an opportunity, an opportunity to talk about your work that you've been slaving away over that's been on this crazy roller coaster ride that is the PhD um, and turn it into that opportunity. And um, yes, that means you'll probably be nervous, but there's a whole lot of strategies to think about. What makes you calm in particular situations, whether it's you know, being really careful about your preparation and being um, doing practice and talking about those ideas. Um, thinking really clearly through you know, what what your responses to different kinds of questions and different kinds of situations might be. Keeping yourself in check in case you do get defensive, I think that's a really important a, an important thing to try and avoid. But at the same time, maintaining a positive and assertive kind of engaged tone so that you're showing that you're really engaging with the ideas the examiners put forward to you, um, but at the same time, you're assertive about how you're responding to them as well. Um, uh, what else? Um, think of it also as an opportunity to network um, with your examiners, um, thinking about asking them about publishing. Prepare some of your questions. Um, prepare some questions for the examiners. What would you suggest? Where would you suggest I publish some of this work? Or something like that, so that you've actually um, got some questions up your sleeve for right at the end when they say, have you got any questions for us? And you're like, what? <laughs> you know, so often that will happen. Your examiners will ask you a question. So have some up your sleeve um, ready for that. Um, something that we haven't really mentioned um, is uh, what happens if you think that your examiner hasn't quite got it, hasn't quite fully engaged with your ideas. And I think again, it comes back to what Roger said right at the beginning in terms of Try to recognise in the examination reports if that might be the case, and that might be why they're asking those questions all the time. Maybe they haven't quite grasped the nub of your idea, or they're coming at the literature from a different angle, or they're actually in a slightly parallel field, perhaps, um, so they don't get it. So you need to explain it to them really clearly and recognise, think about where they're coming from and the questions that they're asking. Have you guys got any other tips to sort of? Sort of in terms of wrapping up and bringing together what we talked about. This is one thing we didn't talk about was that I think it's quite useful to take, with, with the people you take on with you, have somebody take notes. Mm. Um, mm. The convener will be taking notes and we'll write the report afterwards. But it just might be that, that your friend or somebody can get more detail for you. So or, the supervisor. or the supervisor, yeah. yes. Sometimes the convener is mm. so busy reviewing yeah. Yeah, that, they can't, that they can't, they're not agile enough to do everything mm. and it does help mm. because uh, it's bring up a question uh, throughout early in the piece and you might have the convener might have missed it mm. and then you the convener writes a bit of a summary uh, which is a summary of the examiner's reports but at least in my experience mm. and then particular things about the exam and uh, that's the basis then for what you have to do. Mm. A guideline rather than. Yeah. Has anyone else got any key things that they want to kind of stress that they've taken out of it? No, I mean, I, I have probably one thing because I just spotted, I just glanced over the little outline you sent to me. Uh, so. <laughs> And I saw that one thing just jumped right into my, into my eye. Uh, we haven't really uh, talked about what happens if uh, your examiners disagree. Mm. And I think maybe before we wrap it really up, I, I'd like to make a, a quick comment and maybe um, uh, that uh, Jenny and Judy could reflect on that too. I would personally say try to convince them because, you know, there, there, there might be a simple reason why they disagree. They didn't, as you said, Sophie, they might not have quite grasped your idea or uh, really understood what, what the fine line of your work was. If you can't um, convince them, um, I think, I mean, and that's, I put myself out there now, so don't rip me apart, please. But I would say, be practical. If it's not an essential part of your thesis, if it's not running against every single fiber in your body, just go with it. 
change little things or something, even after the Oryx, and you will have probably to, to make minor, minor revisions or minor things, as long as these are not really, you know, kind of going against everything you believe in. I personally, out of practicality, just move on. You will be sick by, by that time of your thesis anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's another truth I put out there. Um, just move on and do those little things. Don't argue with the examiners. Um, don't ruin that relationship in a way. Uh, but I think uh, Jenny and Judy probably have a more refined reflection on that. But this is my, my, my raw version from Auckland now. Thank you. Yeah, it can go on a while if you get one of those situations. But yeah, you're right, Roger. You really just have to go with it yeah. um, and just to get it through. Yeah. I don't know how it works at other universities, but this the internal examiner mm -hmm. oversees amendment, yeah. all the amendments, yeah. and uh, you know hopefully that's the examiner that uh, you can convince the most that's right. So that, yeah, that one's arguing with another one. Yeah. You might want to yeah. say, well, you know, we, we need possibly we'd like the examiners to reflect on this, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know I'll be in contact with them mm -hmm. later. If it's the one that's going to be for us the um, internal, then that's the one to go with, quite mm. frankly. Mm. As Roger said, unless it's just totally anathema to you, I mean, sometimes it's not worth arguing about a minor couple of sentences or you quote quoted someone else has got a different view. Uh, I just tell them to do what they're told. Yeah. Mm. It's much easier. <laughs> yeah, like, you don't have to do that in your paper or your book. Mm. You can assert yourself even more. I mean, it might just be adding a couple of paragraphs yeah. about a literature that the examiner wants you to incorporate, and, yeah. and it's actually it's a, a day or two's work max, you know, for what to have you on. Okay, so I'm really mindful of time. Is there anyone else out there who has anything to add about sort of key things to take away? Uh, just a just a clarification. Uh, what's the difference between resubmitting and dealing with corrections and, uh, and amendments? And how much time do you have to resubmit or to do the amendments if there's a difference? Um, so you guys might correct me, but there's usually kind of, I think, five different categories um, that you'll fall into. One is that it's fine as it is and you are uh, awarded the degree straight away. The second one is some minor sort of editorial amendments that are not expected to take more than a couple of weeks. Corrections. Corrections. Oh, they're called yeah. corrections. But again, it varies at different institutions. The third one is um, some more substantial revisions, which might be anything from adding a few paragraphs to giving it a really thorough edit to addressing, referencing, to actually adding or reshuffling a chapter or something. Mm -hmm. That might take, I think it's up to three months. Yes, I forget the time limits. Um, um, and then beyond, yeah. sort of beyond that, um, you're looking into the resubmission and the time frame for resubmission, I think is usually six, six months. Six plus. Months. Yeah. So it varies a little bit with institutions, but have a look at your PhD regulations because yeah, that information be. will be out there. In, a, in, a, a, in Otago, the resubmission means it's got to go to all examiners again, again. Mm -hmm. and that's why a convener hates them. Mm -hmm. uh, we <laughs> so try to push them to amendments, <laughs> some yeah, of us. Yeah. Uh, it's often easy. I've managed to do that with a law student who had to do major changes, mm -hmm. but I got it to amendments. Thank God. Well, I just to put in there. I kind of slightly disagree with Judy here, uh, out of my personal experience. Um, not not so much whether the the uh, the chair hates it or not. That might be the case, but uh, I think sometimes it's really, even though it's it's the more disappointing outcome. But uh, taking into account that you have to make major changes or resubmit, resubmission just allows you a bit more time to do that. Mm -hmm. I personally think sometimes it is a wise choice to go for resubmission rather than fighting too hard and then squeezing the PhD student into that tight time frame of a major revisions. It really depends, of course, on the case. But sometimes uh, I think it is, it is for the better, and I speak out of my personal experience here. I got 12 months to resubmit, and that was the best thing ever happened to me because I already had started my next position, and I wouldn't have had enough time to simply do it in six or three months. Mm -hmm. I think this is really depends, so don't be afraid and don't 
I mean, you know, that's the worst thing what can happen. Oh, so what? Another year. You spent already four on it, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think we do sort of need to wrap it up here. Um, uh, thank you all for your questions and um, your engagement, and I hope it's been useful. Um, and I think we're going to try and put together some resources for on the ESOCSI website. Um, we'll, just, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to see if we can dig anything out. If, anything, if anyone comes across anything that's really good, then send it through to me. Um, but thank you all, and good luck. I'm sure you don't need luck. Oh, Marcel's got one just, more thing just to Just a parting shot about the oral. I mean, I think probably never again in your life are you going to get two, up to two hours to talk about your own work yes. to an audience who takes you seriously. So, so enjoy it. Yes. Yes. It is something to be enjoyed. It's better, it's better than any conference presentation. Yes. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so thank you all. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah.